friends, my name is Emily and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be sharing with you the books that I hauled in the first six months of 2021. This is to keep myself accountable because one of the goals that I have set for this year is that I read all of the books that I buy in 2021. Some of the books that I have hauled are for the patron monthly drop-in book club. Those have all been read or I'm reading the one actively for the book club right now. Some of them are pre-orders from October 2020 when I was still an Indigo employee. Right before I quit it was staff appreciation weekend which means that our discount was increased by another 10% and so I went wild uh, and so pre-orders have continued to come in and then some of these things our impulse buys and I'm filming this video more for me because I started the year doing a really good job reading what I hauled and that has not continued. I'm only going to talk a little bit about the books that I haven't read because I have talked about these books in my monthly wrap-ups as I've read them. I will put in the cards the monthly wrap-ups as we go. So in January of 2021 I hauled six books and I have read all of them and they are an absolutely remarkable thing. The House on Mango Street, a Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, Know My Name, Ninth House, and Brown Girl Dreaming. In February, I hauled four books and I read one of them. So I hauled The Sundial, The Centaur's Wife, The Once and Future Witches, and The Dead Hours of Night. So let's talk about the three that I have not read yet. The first one is Shirley Jackson's fourth novel, which is The Sundial. I ordered this when a loose adaptation of Shirley Jackson's life came out on Amazon. I was worried that I was going to have to read her novels to avoid spoilers because it was a biographical piece. So I ordered The Sundial and Turns out I didn't need to, <laughs> but I do intend to read all six of Shirley Jackson's novels, so ordering this I just have it now. This is about the Halloran mansion. When the Halloran clan gathers at the family home for a funeral, no one is surprised to see peculiar Aunt Fanny wander off in the garden. But she returns reporting an astonishing vision. Her late father has appeared to her and given her the exact date of an imminent apocalypse from which only the Hallorans and their hangers-on will be spared. Soon the family is engulfed in madness, fear, and violence. Uh, so this sounds fantastic. I have two of Shirley Jackson's other novels that are earlier, so hence the sticky note fourth novel. That is waiting until I've read its friends. The next book I have here I've actually started and I have the dust jacket for here. It's Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. So this sounds like a fantastic concept, but I am struggling to get into it. So it's about three sisters who are witches. Witching is sort of outlawed and they are in New Salem and New Salem is super like patriarchal and gross and they are trying to get the witches back together, like the witches back into power. And it sounds like it should be my jam, but it is a novel that flips perspectives between three sisters and I do have issues with multiple POV novels sometimes. I don't know if that's it, if it's just the wrong time. I have started this, I just haven't felt the urge to finish it. The next book I have here was a pre-order. This is Dead Hours of Night story by Lisa Tuttle. So this is part of the Monster She Wrote series. I really enjoyed the first book in the series. I was deeply disappointed by the second book in the series that I picked up. It was super ableist. Unfortunately, you will see a couple of these ladies in the stack. Because I had pre-ordered a bunch of them before I had read any of the branching offs of Monster She Wrote, I am curious if that's going to be a through line. I do want to get to this this year so that I can report back to you folks because I have definitely like hyped up Monster She Wrote in other videos and I would love to know if I truly stand behind that. Those are the three books that I hauled in February and haven't read yet. In March I hauled eight books. Lisey's Story, Return of the Trickster, Franny and Zoe, Trap Lines, Later, Bridge of Souls, The Bishop of Hell, and Blood Sports. So Lisey's Story is a Stephen King novel. It's a chunker. I impulse purchased this because I saw the hardcover being blown out because the new TV adaptation editions were coming out. It is one of my goals to read all of Stephen King's works. He's a problematic fave, shall we say. I just realized I'm missing a Zoom meeting. Two hours later. 
So I went to the meeting, had some lunch. We're gonna continue. I actually don't know what this is about, nor do I particularly care to. I picked it up because I'm, I'm working through all the books anyway, right? So March is when The Return of the Trickster came out by Eden Robinson, and I did read that because there was big hype around her new release, Indigo put all of her back catalog on sale. So I picked up two of her works that I am missing. One of those is Trap Lines. I believe this is a short story collection. Yes, of Heisla Hiltzuk stories. So Eden Robinson is indigenous. I love her writing. I picked it up because I do intend to read everything that she has written because I love Monkey Beach and the first two books in the Trickster trilogy. Then I picked up Later by Stephen King. This I chose not to pre-order because Indigo always screws me over with the pre-orders. Big names like Stephen King will be price pointed. With paperback like this, I knew it was gonna drop to 10 or $15 at some point, and I believe I did pick this up for $10. This is Stephen King's latest book, at least as of June 2021 when I'm filming this. It's his latest book. There is another one coming out, I think maybe in July, but it is a hardback and it is a crime novel, and I'm I might get that one from a library. This is about a child born with an unnatural ability. His mother urges him to keep secret. Jamie can see what no one else can see and learn when no one, uh, and learn what no one else can learn. This sounds very much more like my preferred type of Stephen King writing. Like it seems like lately he's gotten into slightly more realist, less um like classic horror, which is fine. You grow and develop over your career. But I don't love a lot of his latest works as much as his older works, so I'm excited about that. Then we have Bridge of Souls by Victoria Schwab, which I actually pre-ordered in March of 2020 during the first Indigo Staff appreciation right before we locked down. Um, we went into lockdown around March break then, and we had a staff appreciation, and this publication date kept getting bumped and bumped and bumped until finally it came out almost a full year later. This is the third book in a middle grade series about a girl who can see ghosts, and her parents are professional ghost hunters. One parent is, like, into the history, the other parent is into the, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow-esque approach to ghosts and the supernatural, and neither of them realize that their child can actually genuinely see ghosts. They're filming a reality television show, visiting the world's most haunted places. They're having fun, but they don't actually see ghosts, whereas Cass actually sees ghosts. They're just fun, and I find myself doing a lot of googling of the history of the places that the reality show is taking place in. Like, the first one is in a castle in Edinburgh, I believe, and the second one is in the Paris Catacombs, and this one is set in New Orleans. I'm excited for that. Here's the other pre-order in the Monster She Wrote series. This is The Bishop of Hell by Marjorie Bowen. The premise of that series is that they are reprinting women who write in this speculative fiction leaning towards horror genre who are out of print and forgotten and they are republishing these works in these stunning editions. So I do want to get to this again this year because I want to know if I should continue pre-ordering the series. Like was Nightmare Flower by Elizabeth Engstrom, like a one-off bad call, or are they all gonna be icky? Then I have that second Eden Robinson, Bloodsport. This doesn't really sound up my alley all that much, but it's Eden Robinson and I trust her. It's about a cat and mouse relationship between two cousins. One is a drug dealer who gets his cousin caught up in his problems all the time. And so that was the last book I hauled in March. So I hauled nine books in April. Johnny Appleseed, Delicates, Broken, The Skin We're In, Lord of the Flies, A History of Children's Books, Kate and Waiting, The Ones We're Meant to Find, and The Strange Library and I only have four unread from the nine. Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead is one of those books. This was the winner for Canada Reads this year, so my radar was already up towards it, and then I finished Refuse, Camlet, and Ruins, and an essay by Joshua Whitehead closes the collection, and that sealed the deal. I needed to pick this up. So this is about a two-spirit indigiqueer who has to go home for the funeral of his stepfather. I feel like this might be a tough read, but everything that I've heard about it, it says it's amazing. So 
I'm excited. Then we have The Skin We're In by Desmond Cole. Well, please. The Skin We're In by Desmond Cole, which is for my works Diversity, Equity, and Inclusions book club. I am most of the way through this. We are meeting at the end of June to discuss this, so I mean, I've hauled it. It's technically unread at this point, but it's in progress and I know it's gonna happen. A history of children's books. I was thinking ahead to Ursula Nordstrom pulling something together around children's literature and her works and I have a bunch of scholarship on children's literature from when I did my master's and like the reading that I've sort of kept up with since but this is something relatively new that I hadn't encountered before and I think it might be just a fun brush up of my academic area of interest and it's kind of what it says in the tin a history of children's literature in a hundred works so looking at what has influenced and shaped the genre then we have the ones we're meant to find by Joan He so there was a bunch of drama around the Descendant of the Crane by Joan He, something about her not getting paid by her publisher in North America. This is apparently with a different publisher, um, and so I decided to support Joan He and pick this up. It's about a human who is woken up on an abandoned island. She has no idea how she came to be marooned there or what her life was like before. She only has the rickety house by the sea, the android she built for company, and a single memory. Somewhere beyond the horizon she has a sister and it's up to Key... Key? C. To escape the island and find her. It sounds amazing. I like sister stories a lot. I like family stories a lot, so I'm excited to get to that one. I will try and find the article that discusses what went on with Joan He and Descendant of the Crane, Descendants of the Crane, her first book. So there's that. In May, I hauled three books Pumpkin, Bailey's Cafe, and Heartstopper. Pumpkin by Julie Murphy is a pre order. This is the third third and final book set in this dumpling, dumpling, pudding, and pumpkin. They go together. They're set in the same universe. We'll see some overlapping characters. And I believe Murphy has mentioned that pumpkin is the last in this little trilogy of characters in the same universe. This is about someone who wants to go to prom and drag. And I mean, Julie Murphy books always feel like a warm hug, so it was sort of like an instant pre-order for me. I didn't ask too many questions and I'm excited for it. The other book is for the patron drop-in book club for June, so I'm currently reading this. I don't know when this video is going to go live, but so far this is so good. It is about a cafe that seems to open to other wheres and whens. Like, people are coming into this cafe not because they need to eat. They, there are people who all have a similar need and the cafe fulfills that need and so they're sort of drawn in from... it sounds like all over. It's a supernatural cafe and so far I'm like two chapters in. It is really good and I'm so excited to see where this goes. So those were the three in May. Not bad. So in June I have hauled five books. Three are here two haven't arrived. So the first is The Wide Sargasso Sea, which was the other, one of the other options for the patron book club. I would have been happy if any of the suggestions won, but also this sounds amazing. It is looking at the the mad woman in the attic in Jane Eyre and like playing with that idea, and I am excited because I am of the opinion that Mr. Rochester is a gummy douchebag and I'm here for people rereading the plotline of Jane Eyre in which the house that his mad wife in conveniently burns down. Like I'm I'm so down for people playing with that narrative. The next book is a pre-order. It is The Galaxy and the Ground Within. This is still Indigo employee October 2020 pre-order. The Galaxy and the Ground Within by Becky Chambers. This is the fourth in the Wayfarer series. I don't know if there are going to be more because she's starting a new series with the the Wild Built, something the Wild Built. I'll put the title on the screen. And I also don't know what it's about. And I don't really want to know in case it's slightly more connected with the third book because I haven't read the third book yet. I have only read the first two and loved them. Okay. The battery died and we were so close to the end. I have The Interestings by Meg Wolitzer here. I got this idea in my head and I really want to do it. This is on a list of 10 books that 
you should read if you want normal people vibes. So I don't know what it is. Normal People by Sally Rooney has... It was a book that I initially didn't like. The more I reread it, the more I want to reread it. These characters are living rent free in my head. I regularly think about them. I've watched the TV adaptation several times now. I've listened to the audiobook several times. It's just comforting and I want more like it. I want more messy young adult relationships. So I looked up a list. I will try and find that list and link it down below. I picked two from the list that sounded the most appealing to me based on what I liked about normal people. And also I am trying to read less men. So I'm not gonna lie, I immediately eliminated the male authors from the list. As I'm tracking my stats, it is so easy to pick up books by men and like so much of the TBR that I have collected already is just sort of uncritically by men and then so much of my red bookshelves are books by white men because I did an English lit degree and that is largely the canon that will be taught to you in an English lit degree. I'm really trying to make an effort to center women's voices. So this is about six teenagers at a summer camp for the arts who have become inseparable and then decades later the bond remains but so much else has changed. Not everyone can sustain an ad in adulthood what seems so special in adolescence. Wolitzer is following her characters from the height of youth through middle age as their talents, fortunes, and degrees of satisfaction diverge. I think this is probably on the list because of how we follow Marianne and Connell from high school, like their last year of high school through, I believe their university degree and then graduate studies programs, if I'm not mistaken. Then there are two books that are not physically in my possession at this moment because they are in the mail. And the first is Fates and Furies by Lauren Groff. So this was again on that Sally Rooney list. And because I'm prioritizing women's voices, I picked it. It takes place in New York and examines how different people in a relationship can have disparate views of the relationship and the idea of how different opinions of like two people are in the same relationship but how they are viewing that relationship very different sounds very Marianne and Connell so I'm excited for that and the other book that is still in the mail is Cultish by Amanda Montell so Amanda Montell wrote Word Slut which is all about sexism built into language she is a linguist I had trouble with this word the last time. She studies language and so her book is about cults, like the language of cults. I'm assuming the language and the word choices that have power to affect and manipulate people and I'm excited for it. Like I loved Word Slut. I learned a lot from Word Slut and it was just a fun time reading it. It made me think a lot about the language that I use. So editing Emily here, I Impulse purchased two books after that video was filmed. I picked up Burial Rights by Hannah Kent because I saw this on sale for like six or eight dollars. This has been on my TBR, my, my wish list for a long time. I believe Jen Campbell is the one who brings it up over and over again and has me interested in it. Charged with the brutal murder of two men Agnes has been removed to her homeland's farthest reaches to an isolated farm in northern Iceland to await execution. Horrified at the prospect of housing a convicted murderer, the family on the farm avoids Agnes. So it's about a doomed young woman who in the early 19th century became the last person to be publicly beheaded in Iceland. I'm excited for a woman who is going to get publicly beheaded. It's a chunker. I didn't realize it was this chunky because, uh, yeah, so this is The Grey House by Miriam Petrosian, translated by Yuri Makassov. Makassov? I apologize. It's bound to wheelchairs and dependent on prosthetic limbs, the physically disabled students living in the house, in the house, are overlooked by the outsides. Not that it matters to anyone living in the house, a hulking old structure that its residents know is alive. From the corridors and crawl spaces to the classrooms and dorms, the house is full of tribes, tinctures, sacred teachers, and laws, all seen and understood through a prismatic array of teenagers' eyes. Now I'm wondering if 
I'm pretty sure it was Jen Campbell who talked about this, but now I'm wondering if it's not, if it was somebody talking about boarding school books. Either way, it sounds fantastic. The tagline is, in this house, rules of the outside do not apply. Disabilities aren't liabilities. It's the disabilities aren't liabilities aspect that makes me think that it was Jen Campbell that inspired this impulse purchase, but uh, now I'm not so sure. That truly is the last book that I have hauled in June. It is now June 28th. I'm editing this video and I'm not gonna buy anything else. Those are all of the books that I have hauled in the first half of 2021. These are the unread ones. 20 unread books accumulated in the first half of the year. This is still a manageable number of books to read. So this is calling myself out. You probably can't do more than this, so. <laughs> You need to start watching what you're buying. I know that the drop-in book club is going to continue for the rest of the year, so that's six more books. If I want to keep things manageable and actually read what I own and read what I bother buying, I need to be a little bit more cognizant of what I am doing. That brings me to the end of this book haul. Have you read any of these books? Do you love any of these books? I would love to hear from you. Thank you to my patrons who make videos like literally like this one possible. Basically anything that I purchased without the Indigo employee discount has been purchased with Patreon funds. I do allocate the Patreon funds to put back into the channel so if I need equipment filming equipment, like I needed a new memory card this year. That came from Patreon funds. Any of the books that I want to read for certain videos, that comes from Patreon funds. So thank you patrons for allowing me to purchase the books to make the content. I really appreciate that you continue to feed my need to read, but it also has to stop. I could put that Patreon money aside and I don't know, invest in a cuter background because this is a hot mess. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're staying safe and I will see you soon with another video. Bye.